So folks, we're going to be in Philippians chapter 4, and this is, and I'm so glad to be able to teach here today. Uh, I wasn't really slated to be here, and, and uh, the one who was going to teach wasn't able to make it. And so a couple weeks ago, I found out that uh, I was asking, you know, can I switch places? I was supposed to teach on Mother's Day. And uh, so I said, yeah, I'll, I'll be glad, uh, glad to do that. Folks, this passage has just meant the world to me, and I hope it means the world to you. So I hope you have your Bibles. We're going to dig right into it. And for those of you that are new here today, welcome to the body of Christ here at Big Valley Grace. We're going to study the word together. We're going to read it together. There's a note sheet that you should have got received. And if you didn't get them, you can download them off of the internet. Um, but uh, we're going to walk through this together. Uh, Philippians is a unique book. Out of all the books that Paul wrote, this one, there's a flavor of it being a very personal, intimate letter. And if you haven't done so, I want to encourage you to go back and to start reading from Philippians chapter 1 through the end of this chapter and see it as a personal letter from the Lord through the Apostle Paul to you. You look at these verses and there will be many that you will underline as you hear the Lord speaking and he speaks your name. For, for instance, in Philippians chapter 1, he says to and I'm going to put my name, Lonnie, in it. It says, Lonnie, I'm going to complete what I have begun in you. I promise that. When, he, when Paul says, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain, I hear the Lord say, Lonnie, is that true for you? Is it about me? Can you find your contentment and joy in me and see that the circumstances of life are leading up to the glory of God? Can you see that? When he says in Philippians chapter 2, says, do nothing, Lonnie, from selfishness or empty conceit. And when I first encountered that, I was going through a crisis of faith as a young man. And I began to put my name in these, in these passages of scripture. It says, Lonnie, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, such as when you do this. <laughs> but with humility of mind, let each of you guard one another as more important than yourself. Don't look out for your own interests, but also for the interests of others. I heard... Paul say that to me, like he wrote this letter to me. When he says, Lonnie, don't worry about anything, but pray about everything. Tell God your needs and don't forget to thank him for his answers. This is Philippians chapter 4, 6 and 7, the New Living Translation. I memorized it. I could hear the Lord speaking to me and to say, Lonnie, don't be anxious about anything. I want you to pray about everything. I want you to tell me your needs and don't forget to thank me for his answers. When he says, I can do all things, Lonnie, you can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. I want you to read it like that. And as you read through the book of Philippians, you're, you're going to notice that this book is all about joy. Over and over again, it's going to talk about, it's going to use the word joy and rejoice multiple occasions, more than any other letters. Paul wants us to have a deep and abiding joy. And folks, there's a big difference between happiness and joy. Many of us are chasing happiness. We want happiness in our marriages. We want happiness in our jobs. We want happiness in every facet of life. And there's nothing wrong with being happy, but it's important to realize that happiness, and I know you know this, is a temporary state. Doesn't last long. Go to Disneyland and see how long it lasts. It's the happiest place on earth, right? And you'll pay the ticket more than you should. And you'll go in and for a moment it's happy until you're going to up to one of the... Um, food courts, and you're going to buy food for your kids, and if you're a dad, you're no longer happy. <laughs> and then you go into a line, and you wait for 45 minutes, and all the happiness is gone by then, right? And yet we keep chasing after this happiness, and the Bible says it's, it's like the wings of an eagle. It continues to, to fly away, and, and I see a lot of young people in here. If you, if you make it your goal, your goal and your desire to be happy, you're going to find it that it's a temporary feeling and it doesn't last long. And ultimately, you'll never be happy. A wife's not going to make you happy. A husband's not going to make you happy. Children aren't going to make you happy. None of that's going to make you happy. What the Lord wants us to give us is joy. And joy is different than happiness. It's a state of being that is a gift from God. It's based upon, and get this, folks, upon his promises and our confidence in his word. This joy is something you and I choose. And we're able to choose it because of God's word and his promises and our confidence in his word that he will do what he says he will do. So when you look at the Apostle Paul, 
who had been in jail and prison unjustly for five years. He wasn't where he wanted to be. He says, I count all of these experiences, including being shipwrecked, as joy. How in the world could he do that? When I am in prison in Philippi and my back has been broken up by the, by the rods and the whips and I'm in stocks and chains, how do I find joy where I just experienced that and yet I count it all joy for the sake of Christ? What a privilege it was to suffer. Well, how could Paul do that? Because he knew what the promises of God were for him. He knew that God promised he'll never leave you, he'll never desert you. And I promise you that all of these things are going to work out for good to those who love me and called according to this purpose. And Paul was able to say in Philippians chapter one, folks, let me tell you, I know it bothers you that I'm in jail. This, when you read Philippians, you'll hear this. And he says, but folks, you need, to, you need to hear the rest of the story. I mean, before I got to Rome, I was in the court of Felix, who's a powerful king, I was with Agrippa and his wife Bernice and I shared the gospel with them. Everybody in the court heard about that. All the soldiers and the guards heard about that. I was on a boat that had over 200 sailors on it. They heard about Jesus. We were shipwrecked. A whole island heard about Jesus. I got to see the king of that island. He heard about Jesus. A whole bunch of people got healed. And now I am chained to these guards and every one of them is hearing about Jesus. And guess what? And you're going to see this as we read through. Four. It goes all the way up to Caesar's household. I mean, that the gospel went all the way up and you know who Nero is, right? One of the worst Caesars that Rome ever had. He got to hear the gospel from Paul. And Paul couldn't wait for his hearing. When he could tell Nero, who was about 28 years old, all about Jesus. He said, I count it all joy. Lord, if this is what it takes, that you would find pleasure to use my life, that Nero would hear about Jesus, then bring it on. And so he says these things, says, folks, we, we, we look at his promises, this is why we study, this is why we come on Sundays, this is why we have the notes, is that, it's why I want you to go home and you look up these verses and you write them down because these are rock solid promises that you can take to the bank and you can say, God, you said that you'll supply all of my needs if I just trust in you. You said you would give me a peace that surpasses all understanding. Lord, you said that you're able to do with your outstretched arms Make the heavens and the earth, nothing's too difficult for you. Lord, I, I'm trusting you now. I need you right now. And I'm able to do all things through you who gives me strength. Lord, I need you right now. You see how all of that works? Big difference between happiness and joy. So let's read Philippians chapter four. It won't be on the screens. It'll be there in your Bible or on your cell phone, whatever it is that you're using, but let's track with me. Understand that when this was written, there was no verses, no chapter breaks. The four one probably should have been in chapter three. But anyway, we're just going to walk through this because this is all good. And um, man, we, don't be afraid to mark up your Bibles when you hear verses that speak to you. So let's look at, follow with me, chapter four. I'm reading out of the New American Standard, so it might be a little different version than yours, but it's the word of God. Paul says, therefore, since these things are true, and that goes back up to chapter three, where <clears throat> he's going to transform our body into humble state and and other things. Since these things are true, my beloved brethren here at Big Valley Grace, whom I long to see, my joy and my crown. Folks, in this way, stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. And now he's going to speak to two ladies that are in a group that are listening to this letter. They've been at odds with each other. Part of Philippians chapter 2 is that to do nothing for selfishness or to conceive is addressed to these two ladies. They've been saying, yes, yes, yes. And now he's going to call them out because they're not getting along. He says, I urge Yodia and Syntyche to live in harmony in the Lord indeed, true companion. I ask you that, uh, ask you also to help these women who have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel together with Clement also and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Underline book of life. You, God keeps good records, folks. And you want your name in the book of life. So when your name is entered in the book of life, it's not erased. It's there forever. You can read more about it in Revelation chapter 20. Verse four now, rejoice, Paul says. Rejoice in the Lord. Find your deepest joy in the Lord always, in every circumstance, always. Again, I will say rejoice. Verse five, let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. That's good to remember. He's closer now than he's ever been before. 
Verse six, be anxious. Don't worry about anything. Be anxious for nothing but in everything and all things, big and small, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the what? The peace of God. Boy, that's a treasure. Which surpasses all comprehension beyond all understanding will keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Verse eight, finally, brethren, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute or reputation, if there's any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, what does it say, folks? Dwell on these things. Let your mind park on these things. And the things you have learned and have received and heard and seen in me and seen in Joel and seen in Pastor Rick and seen in others, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. Follow their example. Verse 10, but I rejoice in the Lord greatly. For now at last you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned before, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak from want, but I have learned to be content. That's a thing to underline. Paul has learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with humble means. I also know how to live in the prosperity in any and every circumstance. I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all of these things and more through him, through Christ who strengthens me. Nevertheless, you have done well to share with me in my affliction. And they gave him a financial gift. You yourselves also know, Philippians, that at the first preaching of the gospel, now after I left Macedonia, which is like a state in uh, Greece, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving but you alone. You're the only ones. For even in Thessalonica, which is the next town south, about 40 to 60 miles south, which is where Paul went from Philippi to Thessalonica, you sent a gift for more than once for my needs while I was in Thessalonica. Not that I seek the gift itself, but I seek for the profit, which in, increase to your account. But I have received everything in full and have an abundance. I am amply supplied, having received from Epaphroditus, you can read about it in chapter two, who nearly died, what you have sent, a fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. And Lonnie, my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. And now to our God and Father be the glory forever and ever, amen. And he has a closing greeting. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brethren who are with me, which include Timothy, greet you. All the saints greet you. In Rome, especially those of, what does it say? Caesar's household. That's Nero. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Fantastic letter. Let me pray. Then we're going to break it apart. Father, thank you so much for your good work. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity. Lord, how good you are in every way you are good. I'm so grateful, Lord, that your promises are sure. That your word is absolute and eternal. You said your heaven and earth will pass away, but your word will not pass away. We can take it to the bank. That what you say, you will do. What you have promised, you will fulfill. And we're grateful, Lord, that we have your word, that has stood the test of time, that it's true and it's rock solid because of who you are. And so, Lord, would you speak to us? I know we have lots of visitors here today. You've drawn us together for this time. It's for your purposes, Lord, that we're together here today and for those who are watching. Would you be exalted and glorified and may we experience as Paul has experienced your faithfulness where we can say through Christ he has been my strength and my hope and I've discovered that I can face any situation in Christ who's given me the strength. So Lord we bless you and we praise you and we thank you and we trust in you in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Folks this is a great letter. And there's about eight things that Paul's going to say here that he, he's giving him directives. He's just boom, boom, boom. There's all these little bullet points that he has. We're going to walk through, starting in verse one here, what is he saying? And so if Paul were here today, what would he say to us right out of the gate? Verse one, look at verse one. It says, therefore, my beloved brethren, whom I long to see, my joy and my crown, in this way, stand firm in the Lord. And so if you were here today, 
He would say that no matter what the circumstances are, stand firm in Christ. No matter what the circumstance. If you're being challenged in your marriage, stand firm in Christ. If you're having a tough time at work, you stand firm in Christ. If you're not getting along with your kids, you stand firm in Christ. Whatever the circumstances are in your life, the diagnosis that you've got, you stand firm in Christ. The word uh, stand firm is one word in the Greek, it's steko, and it means to drive a stake in the ground. And those of you who've been in the military, you understand what that means. You drive the stake, you plant your feet, and from this spot, I am not moving. They're gonna have to drag me off of this spot. I'm gonna hold fast. In fact, over 14 times, Paul is gonna use the words, stand firm, hold fast throughout his writings. The picture of it is similar to Jacob who is wrestling with the angel of the Lord that you'll find in Genesis and he's wrestling with his angel all night. His hip is out of socket. He's in extraordinary, extraordinary pain. And he's holding on. The angel of the Lord says, let me go. The morning is coming. And he says, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. That is what he's referring here to. Is that whatever the circumstances are, that we're going to hold fast on to Christ. Paul was concerned about two things. As you read through the letters that he writes to the Galatians and to the Ephesians and to Colossians and to the rest of them, his concern is, is that you will slide back to where you once were. That when you were once in darkness, you will return back into darkness. You'll step out of light and you're going to slowly slip away. And he said, no, folks, you stand firm. You hold on to Christ. You'll be an imitator of Christ like little children. And no matter what the circumstances are, you hold on to Christ. Because he's your strength and your hope. He's also concerned that there'll be false teachers that will cause you to be able to cause you to think of things that aren't true, that will dilute the gospel or add to the gospel. He says, you hold on to the gospel. You hold on to the truth of, of who Jesus is and who he is in your life. You hold fast to him. You stand firm to him. And no matter what your circumstances are. And I like Habakkuk chapter three, and I hope you look it up. Habakkuk says, and I have a farming background. If the fig tree doesn't blossom and the sheep aren't producing the wool and the meat that you'd hoped for and the gardens that you planted aren't producing any food and it's all drought, yet I will praise you. And there'll be seasons of drought in each of our lives. And in those seasons of drought, you hold fast onto him. There'll be places where you won't want to be. It might be in a hospital bed. It might be alone in your home in tears. You hold fast on to Christ, whatever the circumstances are. Job says, though you slay me, yet I will praise you because of who you are. You hold fast on to Christ. Secondly, he's going to talk to two people here. He's going to talk to Yodi and Sintiki to live in harmony in the Lord. And the problem with Yodi and Sintiki is they got their eyes off the Lord. And Paul is saying here to these ladies in verses 2 and 3, that you live for the sake of the gospel. It's all about Jesus. Why are you two ladies at odds with each other? You have taken your eyes off of what God has been calling you to do. You have been such strong partners with me. What is it that's in your life that is so big that's hindering you and your ability to be effective for the Lord? Folks, put that stuff aside. Get rid of that stuff. It's all about Jesus. In fact, he's going to say in just a little bit, the day is near, the day is close. Ladies, the stuff you have is too small to keep you separated from each other. You live in harmony with one another. You consider the needs are more important than yourselves. You serve one another and have the attitude that was in Christ Jesus who humbled himself. Ladies, humble yourselves. Serve one another for the cause of Christ. And for us today, Paul would say, folks, live for the sake of the gospel. Paul said, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. In Romans 1, he says that the gospel is the power of God that brings salvation to all men. We live for the gospel. I live for the gospel in my workplace. I live for the gospel in my neighborhoods. I live for the gospel for the, for the sake of Jesus Christ and my hobbies and all of my activities. I don't turn it on on Sundays and turn it off on Mondays. I'm walking with Christ 24-7. Because he has a plan for me. Even in the restaurants and the people who serve me is to show off Jesus. 
And that's the next that's the next thing. Look at what he says in verse four. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. And, in, and so in, in any and every circumstance, Paul is admonishing us that we would find our deepest joy in the Lord. Our joy and our confidence is in knowing that we belong to the Lord. He has a plan for our lives. He has purposes for our lives. The plans and purposes are not to destroy us, but for a future and a hope. He is in control and he says, in all of those things, I can give him thanks. I can rejoice in him. I, folks, it is good to know that where you are at and whatever condition you're at, that God is in control. I can recognize that he is the one who's writing the story of my life. And it's not out of his control. The enemy is not going to get the victory here. In fact, what the enemy intends for evil, God intends for good. And Lord, I'm going to wait on you. And then when I wait upon you, I'm going to find new strength. And now I will, because you promised it. You said that those who do will mount up like wings like an eagle. They will walk and not grow weary. They'll run and not faint. Lord, I am waiting upon you. And so I rejoice in you. Always I rejoice. It's a choice that we're called to make. And in, in, any, in any and every circumstance, to find our cheapest Joy in Christ. Look at the next verse. In verse 5, folks, this is huge. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men, for the Lord is near. The idea of a gentle spirit is that character of Christ that shows off. It leaks out. That spirit of gentleness, of believing the best, of being encouragement in somebody else's life, of one who has hope and is looking beyond the circumstances, let that show off that others would see. And the reason, because the Lord is near. You see how those two are connected? If you knew that Jesus was coming tomorrow or today or next week, wouldn't that affect your life and how you connect with people and, what you, and, and the hope that you would be expressing and the joy that you would be expressing knowing that Jesus is coming soon so that when he comes, you run into his arms rather than, oh my goodness, what? No, it, I'm ashamed to meet him. No, I'm eager to meet him. And hear him say, welcome home. That's what he wants for each of us. And so he tells us that you'd be here. Let your gentle spirit be known to be shown by all men. For the Lord is near, folks. The Lord is near. Let your character show off Jesus. And then look, verses six and seven. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And what will happen when you do that? Do you see the answer to that in verse seven? They're connected. Verse seven won't happen without verse six. Look what it says. And, when it says verse and, that's your connection. And, if you do this, and the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Don't you want that? And so if Paul were here today, he would say pray about everything with thanksgiving. Oh, folks, don't ever think that you're bothering him, bothering our Heavenly Father by praying. Don't ever think the thing that you have is too small or too big to take it before the Father. If we were all to pray right now in unison, so there's this, just this, mum, this noise all throughout here, indistinguishable noise, the Lord would be hearing you as though you're the only one praying. He is big enough to hear each of our individual prayers, he would never be saying, oh my goodness, they're all praying at the same time. What am I gonna do? Give me some angels here. I need some help. <laughs> Didn't do that. He beckons us to come to him at any time, in any place, with anything. He says, cast all of your cares upon me. All of them, big and small. You bring it to me. And folks, we have an opportunity with the altar where we... We encourage people, don't come with the same, don't leave here with the same burdens you come. You lay it all before him. We trust him together. We support one another in prayer and encourage. And there's many ministries maybe we can connect you with that will continue to help you to hold on, hold fast. That's why all these things exist. Folks, look at how it begins. Don't be anxious for nothing. Folks, I, I know there are some who are listening and watching, even weeks from now as they watch this. Their life is full of anxiety. They're full of fear of what will happen tomorrow or the next day. Things that are out of their control. That's where anxiety and depression comes from. And they can't fix it. They can't solve it. And he says, 
Don't be anxious about those things. You come and you lay it before the Lord. And if you do that with thanksgiving, how in the world do you take a difficult situation and you bring it to the Lord with thanksgiving? He's not talking about when you have lunch at Wendy's, they make sure you pray for the hamburger. It's, it's bigger than that. Lord, in my diagnosis, I give you thanks. I don't understand it. I don't want it. But Lord, I would not have it if it were not for you. You, are, you have a journey for me, and I praise you for this journey. You know the plans you have for me. You said that the plans you have for me are not for calamity, but for our future and a hope. And so, Lord, I don't know what you have store in this diagnosis. But you wouldn't have me here if you didn't have a bigger plan. And Lord, I praise you because I know what the enemy intends for evil, you intend for good. And so, Lord, I'm gonna wait upon you for the good that you're to bring out of this. And so, Lord, don't, don't let me waste this diagnosis. Help me, to be so, help me not to be so focused on myself that I, I, that I don't see the hurt in others who have no hope that maybe you're bringing me into this waiting room to pray for somebody. Maybe there's a nurse or a doctor that you want me to, to represent Christ in that they would see my gentle spirit. Your unemployment can be a gift from God. Sounds weird, doesn't it? But as you give this to the Lord, say, Lord, I don't know what you have in store for me, but I know you do. And right now, my kids are watching me. My grandkids are watching me hold on to you. And would you use this in their lives to help them to become the men and women you want them to be? Folks, the things that we go through are always bigger than ourselves. It's never about you. It's about what God wants to do, not only in you, but through you. Don't lose sight of that picture. That's why you can come into whatever circumstance that you're in, and you do so with thanksgiving because God is in charge. He has a plan. He will accomplish it. He will not waste it. And he's wanting us to lean upon him as he refines us and he does his miracles in our lives. That's why you can give him thanks. That's why you can give him praise. Let's keep going. Verse eight, it's huge. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, you can read the rest of them. It says, dwell on these things. Let your mind park on these things. If Paul were here, he would say, no stinking thinking. Parents, you help your children in this area. You help yourself in this area. Look what, notice what the first thing is. Whatever is true, let your mind dwell on these things. Whatever is good, let your mind dwell on these things. Folks, this is huge today. For those of you who are parents and grandparents, you have children in the public school systems that is telling them that truth is defined by every individual. You have your truth, you have your truth, you have your truth. My truth is my truth. You do you, you do, you know, you be you. Whatever that is, there's no objective truth. Truth is defined by the, how one feels and how one thinks and the culture and experience that they have. Folks, that is a lie from the pit. That leads to chaos and it leads to destruction. Jesus said there's two paths. One lead, one's wide, leads to destruction. One narrow, leads to life. If you have kids that are holding to this relative truth, they're headed toward the destruction. Paul says, you hang on to what you know is true. Um, you hold on to that which is objectively true, that's true outside of yourself, that is absolutely true, eternally true. It's true here in the United States. It's true in California, regardless of who our governor is. It's true in South America. It's true anywhere you go. And if you could fly off into space to the furthest reaches of the universe, it's true there too. And it makes no difference how you feel about it because it is always true. And it starts with Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God. The makers of the heavens and the earth. All things were made by him and for him and for his glory, including you and me. Including the tiny little bugs and the big nebulas and the stars. He made it all by his spoken word and his outstretched arms. Nothing is too difficult for him. And I don't care how you feel about it, that is true. And you keep reading down through Genesis 1, and in his joy and his delight, male and female, he made them. And he's the author of marriage, not the state of California. 
and you wrap yourself around what you know to be true. What is true, what his word says, and we do this in counseling because many who come to counseling have filled their minds with lies. God doesn't love me. God doesn't care for me. God doesn't answer prayer. He's doing this for, against me because he hates me. All those are lies from the pit. What is true? God has an everlasting love. He's full of compassion. His mercies are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. Oh, Lord, our God, you will never leave me. You'll never desert me. You have a plan for me. And what the enemy intended for evil, God means for good. Folks, you just rehearse all of those things. And he says, those are the things you park your mind on. Not the, not the lies from the enemy. And so whatever is good, whatever is true, whatever is, whatever is a good reputation, whatever is morally pure, let your mind dwell on those things. Don't fill your mind with stuff that takes your heart away from the Lord. It's good words, folks. It's true. And then lastly, even though in verse 8 he says finally he adds one more thing and it's found in verse 10 through 21. Folks, learn the secret of contentment. Paul says that my happiness and my joy is not based upon how much I have or how little I have. Paul says, I've experienced it all. I have had seasons of drought in my life. And for him, part of it, sometimes churches like Philippi would send him some money. Sometimes they didn't. Sometimes he'd make tents that didn't sell. Sometimes he couldn't make enough tents. And God just overwhelmingly supplied his need for his purposes and his glories to be a conduit of blessing to others. And Paul says, I, I, know, I know how to, I, I, I've experienced much and I've experienced little. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Because my contentment is not how much I have and my discontentment is not how little I have. My contentment is found in the Lord who unchangingly forever loves me. And his mercies flow to me day and night, day and night. They flow to me, and I praise him for it. Learn the secret of contentment. So I have two questions as we conclude here today. This is a powerful chapter. In fact, what made this so difficult to prepare is I wanted to do a message on each one of these points. Because <laughs> each one could stand alone. But is there a verse in chapter four that just really stands out to you? The, you know, the little bell started ringing the Holy Spirit just starts tapping. I don't know what that is. It's probably if we were to do an interview, it would, it'd be different for everybody here, but I bet there's something that hit home. It's not me speaking, it's the Holy Spirit speaking. And as you look at that, and, and, and the second question that I would ask of you is there a specific concern that you need to bring to the Lord? Is there something that is hindering you, is an obstacle to you, defining your deepest joy and confidence in the Lord? And to that I would say, folks, this is why we exist, is to encourage one another. And I hope you sense that encouragement here today. It's not to beat anybody over the head. It's to bring, it's to bring joy that's found in Christ. And folks, we can cast every burden upon him because he cares deeply for us. The, 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 the remedy for worry is prayer. The remedy for weakness is prayer. The, the remedy for pride is prayer. The remedy for your marriage is prayer. You bring it all before him and you be on your knees with your Bible that is open. You're praying the words of God back to him because these are his promises. Your confidence is in him and his promise to fulfill his word. And then we wait upon him and we journal and we write and we wait for the Lord to see what in the world he's going to do. And when we see him move, we praise him for it because he is an awesome God. And I want to leave you with this one verse, this last closing verse. And you put your name in it. Alani, you can do all things that I give to you through Christ who will strengthen you. He'll do that for Tim and Jeannie and Jessica and whoever else who is here. You can do all things through Christ. Not because, you're a pow not because of power of positive thinking. That's not what this is about. The power is in Christ. Whatever it is that he's given you to do, 
your marriage. You can, you can do this marriage through Christ who gives you strength. You can do your job to the glory of God through Christ who gives you strength. You can face whatever temptation that you have with victory through Christ who gives us strength. There's truth in that verse. And what does he tell us to do? We wrap our minds around it. We let our mind dwell on that. And I want to give you a piece of that juicy fruit that you would take home with you. The assurance that God who's at work in each one of us is able to complete what he has begun and he will not fail. His mercies are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness and his plans for us are not for calamity but for our future and hope because of who he is. And if you need prayer today, the altar room will be open with men and women who will love you, who will pray for you. We're here to support you and to encourage you. But you can also do that right here in these rows too with one another. Isn't God's word good? Yeah, I'm so glad that we have this, his word. And it was, was true yesterday, it will be true today, it will be true for your kids and your grandkids and your great grandkids as long as it goes because God's word is unchanging. It's absolutely true. It's always true. It'll be true for them, this is true for us today. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the privilege and opportunity today to walk through your word. And I pray, Father, that today was a cup of cold water in the name of Jesus that brings deep refreshment, living water into the soul that refreshes, invigorates, empowers us to go and be men and women that shine bright for you, that our gentle spirit in Christ would be evident to all that we see. And that we'd be mindful as we live each day that, Lord, you are getting nearer and nearer and nearer. One way or the other, we are gonna see you soon. And so, Lord, we bless you, we praise you, we give you thanks for these promises. And Lord, we look forward to great expectation because on this day when we see you, what a day that will be when we see you face to face. All these trials will seem really small on that day. And we're so eager to hear you say, welcome home, well done. So Lord, bless us as we go our way. Would you meet every need that's here according to the power of your grace in Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen, amen.